This is Ms. Delosier and these are your notes on populations. So the first thing we need to do is we need to actually go ahead and define what a population is. So um, a population is a group of individuals of the same species that are in the same area at the same time. And we as the ecologists or the biologists that are studying the population get to go ahead and define what that area is. Um, and the reason that we study populations um, uh, in population ecology is because we're interested in the interactions between those organisms um, and the biotic and the abiotic factors in an ecosystem. So um, we're basically going to be looking at how do the biotic and the abiotic factors influence the population's density, distribution, and the age structure of the population. So all of these individuals are going to be relying on the same resources. They're going to be interacting with each other, and those can be interactions that are helpful interactions or harmful interactions. And they're most likely going to be interbreeding because most organisms actually do breed within the population that they live in most of the time. Um, so that's what we're going to be looking at. And the first thing we want to do is we want to talk about how we characterize a population as biologists. So the two primary things that we talk about initially are the density of the population um, and the dispersion of the population. So density is really easy. Density is just, um, it's really just how close together. Um, so it's, you know, the concept of density. So we're looking at how close together those organisms are. So the number of individuals per unit area or unit volume. The dispersion is going to be the pattern of spacing between them. Um, and so how are they arranging themselves? So what we want to talk about is the different ways that we can talk about spacing. So these are the different spacing patterns that we can look at. Um, the first one is clumped, and you can see that I've kind of, I've circled a clump here of organisms. Um, so clumped organisms can include things like plants, fungus, animals. Clumped is actually the most common pattern of dispersal that we see. Um, we live in a clumped pattern. Um, you see humans gathered in cities, towns, villages. You very rarely see people that are off by themselves that never um, are interacting with anyone else. We can also have random, um, random dispersal pattern. And a random dispersal pattern tends to happen when you have um, organisms actually getting to that location by wind, uh, water, so like the current, or by animals actually depositing them there. So if you think about the seeds of a plant, um, they can be carried there by the wind, they can be washed there by water, animals can go ahead and consume the fruit and then excrete the, the seeds there. So those are all going to be things that give you random dispersal. Um, you can also have random dispersal within um, within some marine invertebrates when we've talked about the larva um, and they wash and then they wherever they land. So if they're capable of surviving there, their pattern's kind of random. The one that is the most unusual is this uniform pattern. So I've circled two birds and then um, this one right here, I'm going to highlight it purple. There's no bird there. I'm going to unhighlight it so you can see it. But what you might be able to see is you, you might be able to see, let me erase it you might be able to see um, that there's actually a mound there. And so what you're actually looking at here are bird nests, um, nesting on the ground. And and what the reason that they're so evenly spaced there is uh, that these animals are very territorial. So they're going to go ahead and they're going to have some kind of way to maintain that space between them. And that could be um, auditory, it could be physical confrontation between organisms. Um, but they have some type of defense system where they're actually setting a boundary like this is my space and you can't be within that space. Um, so that's that's the territoriality we're talking about. There are examples of uniform dispersal that don't involve that social behavior and those are things like uh, there's plants that actually will go ahead and prevent other plants from growing around them because they they, um, they secrete a chemical that prevents other plants from growing near them. And that would be, again, um, to go ahead and, and allow it to have the most habitat available and to protect its resources. Uh, territoriality, when we talk about it most of the time, is going to be um, related to social behavior within, within a species, and a lot of times it's related to mating behavior. So we're going to talk a lot about that this year. The next thing I want to talk about is 
uh, survivorship curves. So there are these three types of survivorship curves, and I went ahead and I labeled them a little bigger so you can actually see them while we're talking about them. So the survivorship curves are type 1, type 2, and type 3 survivorship curve. And the type 1 curve, it says, is describing humans. Um, so, and then the type 2, it says, is songbirds, and the type 3 is frogs. So let's talk a little bit about what these curves mean. If you look here on the type 1 curve, most of the organisms are surviving, and then you have the death happening, the, the die-off happening, as they approach, um, you know, a, like old age, really. So they're all living. You've got most of your individuals living out of infancy, out of adolescence, into adulthood, and that's when you start to see individuals dying off. In our type 2 individuals, we see this constant death rate. We have a very linear death rate. Uh, you're just as likely to die today as you are to die tomorrow for these organisms. And then in the type 3, you see that you have a very great probability of dying right here. So here, everybody's alive, and then very quickly, almost everybody dies off. But what you'll see is that almost everybody that lives to this point lives for the entire life expectancy. So let's go ahead and let's talk about what this means. A type 1 individual tends to be things like humans and large mammals, and they're going to have the longest life expectancy. Most individuals are going to live into adulthood, and we say that those individuals are K-selected, and we'll talk about what that means later. Type 2, as I said, has a constant death rate, and that's typically going to be things like small mammals and, and small birds. Um, it, it's also hydra, and that's going to be important for when we talk about hydra later in the, in the year. But really, right now, you can think of things like squirrels, sparrows, uh, mice, things like that are type 2. They have a constant death rate. They're just as likely to die the day they're born as when they're two months old, as when they're two years old. Constant probability of death on any given day. Uh, our type 3 individuals are kind of weird looking um, on the graph. And so what's happening is almost all of their young are dying when they're infants or adolescents or in the larval stage, because most of these are going to have a larval stage, actually. Um, so what's happening there is those individuals are, uh, we, what we call them is R-selected opportunists, which just means that they're subject to R-selection. So he, that means that they're producing thousands and thousands or hundreds and hundreds of, in, of offspring, most of which are never going to survive. So things like fish, shellfish, frogs, um, those are great examples. Insects. Insects are a really good example also because what happens is once they actually reach adulthood, you can see that most of them are surviving, right? Um, but what's happening up on the first part of the curve is most of those, most of those larvae are actually going to be preyed on by predators. So predators are actually going ahead and killing off the bulk of the of the young. Um, so that's this is a, a survivorship curve, and survivorship curves can be expressed as tables. And when when you see it as a table, it's called a life table. But this is actually, I think, much more informative because you can actually just look at it. Um, so that's that's that. We're going to talk more about that K selected and that R selected on a separate slide. So this is a, um, an age structure curve, and it, it tells you really the relative percent of individuals of each age. So um, I got this graphic off of Wikipedia, and it um, maintains some gender biases to colors. So uh, just so you know, the blue is boys and the pink is girls, um, and I didn't choose that, but I don't think that you can actually read what it says underneath it. And so each of these uh, four curves is showing the percentage of the population that is male and female at different ages. So if you look right here, it's showing the percent of girls and the percent of boys at age 15. So you can see that there's a lot more individuals that are 15 and under there than there are above the age of 65. So um, what that lets you know is that most of our population is very young. And when you have a a population where most of the individuals are young, that lets you know that your population is growing rapidly. So if you look at that one on the left, you've kind of got that exponential curve where the, the base is so much wider than the top. We know that our population is growing very quickly. Our second curve, you still are maintaining that shape where the base is wider, 
but it's not as much of a difference. So this is still showing growth, but it's not as rapid of growth. This next one, you can see that it's about the same percentage all the way up. Just once you get towards the age of 65, do you actually start to have the population tapering off. And what this lets you know is that my population is stable. The population's not growing, it's not shrinking, I have a stable population size. My birth rate is approximately the same as my death rate within the population. And then this last one, if you look, it's weird down at the bottom. I have fewer young um, than I have at that middle area. So if you look between 15 and 65, it's actually wider than in the under 15 category. So this means that I don't have as many babies being born um, as, as I do in the other populations, which means fewer young means that eventually I'm going to have a decreasing population size because my birth rate has gone down is really what this is saying. So you're going you're gonna to see these curves pretty frequently. Um, they'll normally be a little bit more detailed than this, but this is the one that I had available. So now I want to talk about reproductive strategies in R-selected and K-selected, and that is actually supposed to be written there, but for some reason it didn't show up. So K-selected individuals are individuals that reach sexual maturity relatively late. I mean, it's relative to that, spe to that, that type of organism. So um, you as a human, reach sexual maturity when you go through puberty, which is around middle school, right? Insects can reach sexual maturity in a matter of days. So that would be early reproduction compared to humans, right? So K-selected individuals reach sexual maturity late. When they do reproduce, they have very few offspring, and each of those offspring require a significant energy expenditure. So humans typically have one offspring, it is not capable of surviving on its own. You have to put a lot of energy in to get it to the point where it can survive on its own. They're also energetically expensive to produce. Nine months of gestation, 40 weeks of gestation. Our selected individuals tend to have very early reproduction. Uh, they reproduce a lot of offspring, and each of those offspring requires little to no parental care. So you have an energy expenditure to produce the offspring, but you're not expending energy to actually care for the offspring. So when we actually look at these two pictures, which ones are selected, which ones K-selected, the, the, um, the dragonfly is R-selected, the bison is K-selected. So that's really it for our, um, our basic population notes. I hope that helps. If you have any questions, go ahead and come see me at tutorials or send me an email.